Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. I got a big one for you today, a lot of news to talk about. We've got this Maryland midwives disaster we have to talk about. A mass murderer's parents are now on trial. Why people are furious about Margot Robbie. How the WWE and Netflix just changed the game. And could you marry someone with a different opinion on abortion? Because new polling has shown a huge shift in public opinion. We're gonna be talking about that and even more on today's show. So buckle up, hit that like button, let's just jump into it. Starting with, it's my favorite time of year in the world of entertainment because it's Oscar nomination time. And I'm not excited because I'm like, oh man, I really hope blah, blah, blah gets the nomination, but rather because I'm so excited always to go to the internet to see people go, how the fuck did blah, blah, blah not get the nomination? And for me, that's kind of what social media is. You're watching the animals in the zoo and sometimes, you know, you jump in the cage. And this year, it was no different. The announcements were made this morning and we saw some obvious ones, some surprises and some snubs. Oppenheimer leading the way with 13 nominations. Barbie also getting a lot of attention. Nominated for Best Picture as well as getting in for Best Original Song for I'm Just Ken and Billie Eilish's What Was I made for. America Ferreira getting a Best Supporting Actress nomination. Ryan Gosling getting one for Best Supporting Actor, but no Margot Robbie for Best Actress. And Greta Gerwig also getting shit out of the Director category. So that's why you had a lot of people really disappointed if not outright furious today. People like Shannon Watts tweeting, Greta Gerwig made a critically acclaimed, culturally profound feminist movie about Barbie and the patriarchy that made a billion dollars at the box office. Oscar nomination goes to Ken. Though, worth noting, Greta and Margot were nominated elsewhere. Greta got a screenplay nomination. Margot produced the film so she's among the Best Picture nominees. And as far as if, you know, Margot Robbie was robbed, I, I genuinely could not tell you. Because all of the movies for the, the Best Actress nominees, they're all movies that I've literally at one point over the last year been like, oh yeah, I heard about that. I need to watch that. And then I only watched one of them. And Lily Gladstone was fantastic in Killers of the Flower Moon. And I think it's one of the things that makes it hard to have conversations around this. So many people are arguing about what's best without having watched everything. I mean, I imagine a lot of people voting on things have not watched everything. That's going to impact different categories at different levels. I mean, animation, I think, is a fantastic example of that. But Regardless, while all this discourse plays out, the fact that the Oscar nominations are one of the biggest days for entertainment, film, and culture news, especially inside the industry, brings us to the other part of this story, which has to do with Condé Nast employees, because they went on a one-day strike today. Right? And they, if you don't know, they own major outlets like Vanity Fair, Vogue, GQ, Glamour, and more. Notably, they announced layoffs late last year. So we saw 400 members of the company's union walking off the job today, protesting what they said was unlawful bargaining tactics during layoff negotiations. And earlier this month, the union actually filed an unfair labor practice charge with the National Labor Relations Board. And they timed all this for today to prove a point, even doing an Oscar-themed picket outside the New York offices. And one staffer telling The Hollywood Reporter, we just really want to show how much Condé relies on union members to cover big events like the Oscar nomination, or with them hoping to take traffic away from these outlets on a crucial day. Though I will say, I don't know how effective they'll actually be there. Because like, if you go to Vanity Fair's website right now, they have Oscar coverage. It's just that notably, unlike their other things like, oh, this story's written by Brian Stelter, this one's by Kara Warner. These new articles are just written by Vanity Fair. Which makes me wonder, right, was this outsourced? Are there non-union employees doing this, or could it even be AI? But hey, ultimately time will tell how this all plays out. And then in huge business and entertainment news, Netflix is shelling out over $5 billion for the WWE. Billy's with a B. Though specifically, this deal centers around the WWE's flagship live weekly show, Raw, which I, in this moment, have decided it's no more Netflix and chill. It is now Netflix and Raw, dog. Though, you can keep going Raw the old-fashioned way until 2025 when this deal starts. There's also some notable specifics regarding countries. Where the deal is focused on the United States, Canada, the UK, Latin America, with more countries coming with time. Netflix also gets to air WWE shows and specials internationally outside the US as available, that including the likes of SmackDown and other premium live events like WrestleMania. Though in the States, those premium events will stay on Peacock, which I will say, for me, I just feel like we're going to see more people using VPNs. Right, I imagine there's going to be a number of people spoofing where they're watching from so they can just keep watching everything on Netflix rather than having a whole different Peacock subscription. But overall, I mean, this is just a huge deal. Not only because we're talking about a 10-year deal around $500 million a year, but I mean, because we're talking about Raw, which is one of the longest airing live shows ever. And for the first time in three decades, it won't be airing on linear TV. And that $500 million, that's nearly double what the WWE's previous deal was worth with NBC Universal. One of the big winners coming out of this is actually Dwayne Johnson, right? The Rock, because he's not only joining the parent company's board, but the company is now giving him full ownership of his trademarked ring name. And he's now already inked a merchandising agreement with the company. And I'll say for me personally, I find this very interesting. Like, it doesn't even matter if like, you care about wrestling, right? because this is showing yet another big grab and swing from your streaming providers embracing and scooping up live television. And when we see things like the, the resistance 
instance leading up to the the Chiefs Dolphins game only being on Peacock. We then see it become the most streamed live event in the US ever in Peacock being number one in the App Store. And they paid like $110 million for that game. Though I will say the NFL and other entertainment, it's very different. As far as like actually watching live events, the NFL is just miles above most other forms of entertainment these days, right? As far as viewership numbers. But also with Netflix and the WWE and this live entertainment, it's really interesting to think like how much of this is built up around their ad tier subscription level. Are with this being live, are they still gonna have ad breaks? Does Netflix see this as their 10 year juggernaut to build their ad business around? And while time will be the ultimate decider and if this is like the most genius move ever or a big flop, there's no doubt that in the meantime, this drastically changes the landscape. And then should the parents of school shooters be held responsible for their children's actions? That's the question that's playing out right now with this historic trial of the mom of a 2021 school shooter now beginning. Right? Because back in November of 2021, a then 15 year old shooter opened fire at Oxford High School. He killed four people, he injured several others. He then was charged as an adult and he pled guilty to two dozen charges. With that including one count of terrorism causing death and four counts of first degree murder. And last month we saw him sentenced to life in prison without parole. But now his parents are also facing charges in connection with the shooter. With James and Jennifer Crumbly both facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter. And Jennifer's trial begins today with jury selection. And as it turns out, these two parents actually bought the semi-automatic handgun for their son just four days before he used it in the shooting. And then, going even further, prosecutors argue that while James and Jennifer aren't being accused of knowing what their son was going to do, they claim that the parents ignored his mental health struggles and allowed his access to the gun. Because there were several warning signs leading up to the shooting. Like how the day before, their son was caught searching for ammunition online by a teacher. When school officials called Jennifer, she didn't respond. Instead, just texting her son, saying, Lol, I'm not mad at you. You have to learn not to get caught. Also that night, authorities say the son recorded a video planning the shooting, and on the day of the shooting, teachers found a note in his desk with a drawing of a gun and someone being shot that read, the thoughts won't stop, help me. When he was confronted for this, he said it was just a design for a video game and his parents were called in for a meeting with the counselor, where then notably they refused to take him home for the day and school officials allowed him to stay in school. The shooter then moving forward with his plan and committing one of the worst school shootings that Michigan has ever seen. And so with all that, prosecutors argue, hey, when the parents were brought in for this meeting, were the fucking drawing that showed a gun being used to kill someone, they had at least the duty to tell the school about the gun they had just bought for him. With Oakland County prosecutor Karen McDonald saying, the notion that a parent could read those words and also know that their son had access to a deadly weapon that they gave him is unconscionable. The prosecutors also said that the Crumblies were negligent for not securing the gun at home. Though notably for that specific claim, you have some experts saying it's going to be an uphill battle for them to argue because actually at the time, Michigan didn't have a safe storage law requiring adults to secure firearms if their kids are around. And Jeffrey Swartz, a former county judge in Florida and law professor saying, in order to be guilty of involuntary manslaughter, you have to prove that there was a legal duty that was breached. Where was their legal duty? And right now, we really don't know how this is going to play out. Or the Crumblies are essentially the first parents to be charged like this. We're talking about breaking new legal ground. And according to Arthur Bush, a former prosecutor, this case in general may be hard to prosecute. Saying the fact that they bought him a gun when he had these profound mental health problems, that's pretty reckless. But the closer the public begins to look at this, I think there are parents who could say, that could be me. I have this insolent, oppositional child and I get to be liable for that? That doesn't seem fair to me. And the Crumbly's defense team arguing that these parents couldn't have seen this coming. And saying in a failed attempt to dismiss the charges, after every school shooting, the media and those affected are quick to point to so-called red flags that were missed by those in the shooter's life. But the truth of the matter is one cannot predict the unimaginable. But as far as what happens next, you have the Crumblies both pleading not guilty, also opting to be tried separately. And so while Jennifer's trial begins today, James's trial is being scheduled for March. Which I will say, with them being tried separately, it makes you wonder, are the Crumblies going to blame one another? Even Swartz say, if I'm projecting in this particular case, each parent is going to point the finger at the other. Which one knew about their son's problems, who was responsible for hiding and securing the gun? But regarding those defending the parents, you've got the shooter himself who told the judge at his sentencing that he was, quote, a really bad person, saying he couldn't stop himself and of his parents, quote, they did not know and I did not tell them what I planned to do so they are not at fault. But, ultimately, he's not the one that gets to decide. And if they're found guilty, they face up to 15 years in prison. And so with all that, I gotta pass the question off to you. Do you think the Crumblies should be held criminally liable? Did they fail their community and as parents to the point that they should go to prison? Yes, no, maybe so, why, why not? Let me know your thoughts in those comments down below. And then we've got more news you need to know about today, but I gotta take a quick second to pay some bills. Because you know, I love food, especially great food from amazing chefs. And thanks to today's sponsor, Cook Unity, it's possible to have great meals from fantastic chefs that are created in small batches and micro kitchens across the nation. Right? Cook Unity works with top chefs from the likes of Food Network alums, James Beard Award winners, and acclaimed restaurants 
guests are on tours. You know, people who know good food. You know, we've been enjoying what I call delicious ease from Cook Unity for a year now. Meals are chilled and sent fresh, not frozen, so they're ready to heat and eat. Menus are updated weekly, and new chefs are always joining the team. You know, recently we indulged in Iron Chef and James Beard Award winner Jose Garces' shrimp and chorizo paella, which, oh, that chorizo, decadent. I mean, that's not a word I regularly use, but it's spot on here. Jose Garces is a leading culinary authority of Spanish and Latin American food. Which, I mean, just next time I'm in Philly, I'm definitely hitting up his tapas restaurant, Amada. But main thing, Cook Unity offers a range of meals, including vegan, paleo, and gluten-free options. And the subscription is super flexible, making it easy to pause, skip weeks, or cancel any time. And if you haven't already, I recommend that you check them out because they're the most convenient way to get a wide variety of restaurant-quality food from award-winning chefs delivered to your door. Just go to cookunity.com slash Franco or click that link in the description box and use code DeFranco50 to get 50% off your first order of Cook Unity meals. And then we need to talk about this Maryland midwives disaster because it goes beyond just Maryland. With parents forced to watch those responsible for the death of their babies just move on. Right, so let me explain. So the Maryland State Board of Nursing is responsible for overseeing nurses and midwives, with the latter being someone trained to assist in childbirth while not necessarily being a doctor. And while they're not super common, they're also not unheard of. In fact, according to the Government Accountability Office, midwives assisted in 12% of the births in the U.S. in 2021. And this is the number of midwives and midwifery students have increased in recent years. Notably, the extent of care midwives can provide, it varies by state. There are different types. A certified nurse midwife is one that has education in nursing and typically attends on patients within a hospital. But then, certified professional midwives learn through apprenticeships and experience and don't work within a hospital, instead attending to most of the home births across the country. And in Maryland, they're referred to as direct entry midwives, with Maryland law requiring them to get a license from the State Board of Nursing and credentials from the North American Registry of Midwives. And that licensing, it's one of the main functions of the State Nursing Board, along with the investigation of complaints. But there, a Washington Post investigation found that the board has been, at best, struggling at both for years, leaving families who have already suffered an unimaginable loss waiting for justice and putting even more families at risk. And one of these families is the Puckets. Right, following the birth of their first child via C-section in 2012, Naomi Puckett wanted to deliver her second child vaginally. So when she got pregnant again in 2014, she hears about Tina Overton and her business titled Birth Lily Childbirth Services through an advocacy group promoting access to VBACs, which is vaginal birth after C-section. And according to the Puckets, Overton told them that she was a certified professional midwife and had years of training. And an important thing to note here is that the state of Maryland prohibits certified professional midwives from attending VBACs backs at home because the delivery poses a higher risk. Though Naomi said she had no idea about that at the time. And Overton helped her through a successful delivery of their second daughter in August of 2015. So gold star, everything's good. And when they learned that they were expecting again in 2017, the Puckets once again hire Overton. On September 10th, 2017, Naomi goes into active labor. So Overton comes over to the house and with her is a doula, which is a support person for women going through labor. But by early the next morning, Naomi's labor had stalled and there were hours that passed without any checks to her vitals or the baby's heart rate. And at around 9 a.m., Naomi had been in labor for over 24 hours. Hours. Overton then using a Doppler to listen to the baby's heartbeat and then telling the couple that they should drive themselves to the local hospital. And it's there that the hospital staff pronounced the baby boy dead in utero. With Overton arriving shortly after, and very notably, she introduced herself to the staff as Naomi's doula rather than midwife, with Naomi then being diagnosed with preeclampsia and spending days recovering in the ICU. And so then, fast forward a few months later, she shares her story in the birth circle of Baltimore Facebook group. And that's where she hears for the first time that Overton had absolutely no credentials to work as a midwife, with the North American Registry of Midwives director telling the post they had no record of Tina Overton being credentialed, and the state nursing board's public databases don't list her as a licensed midwife. So the Puckets, then they take their case to the police, but they end up getting turned away, with the police saying that it wasn't a criminal matter. And so then they tried an attorney, but no one had any interest in a case against an unlicensed practitioner who likely didn't have any malpractice insurance. And so in 2018, they were encouraged to file a complaint with the state board of nursing. With Naomi writing, she is illegally practicing midwifery care, putting mothers and babies at risk. She has devastated our family. And when asked about Overton, she said, if I had not been under her care, my baby would be alive. And around the same time the Puckets filed their complaint, the Maryland Board of Nursing reported a massive jump in the number of complaints in a single year, going from just over 3,000 to 6,700. And that number has seen very little improvement since. Four years later, that board still has a backlog of over 6,200 complaints. And this is you have the Puckets still waiting for some accountability. And a big thing to look at here is that this board has been under public scrutiny for a while, though prior to this, mostly for their delays in the licensing of nurses, which actually caused many to lose job offers or even leave the state. But with this, right, their investigative failures mean that nurses and midwives who are accused of harmful behavior are just allowed to keep practicing. And in a 2022 meeting, the board's then executive director, Karen Evans, said that the window for closing cases had increased to 540 days. And so in response, a board member and a registered nurse posed a hypothetical question. Or what if you had a nurse accused of diverting drugs, asking would they be allowed to continue practicing for up to 540 days? And to that, an investigator said, 
quote, absolutely. Our team is burned out. I am burned out. We need help. And I've been screaming it from the top of my lungs for a very long time. And that is after an audit from 2021 drew attention to the severity of the backlog. In fact, finding that over 2,700 complaints have been open for more than a year, with the nursing board saying their problems stem not just from their ancient technology system, but from staffing shortages and a devastating ransomware attack in 2021. And y'all get this, according to the Post, the investigation team for the nursing board is made up of four investigators and they're assigned hundreds of cases each. One single person has been assigned to an investigate around 2,800 cold case files. And each month, the investigators take on around 30 new cases each while only closing around five. Right, so this backlog is not going anywhere. And regarding the 2021 ransomware attack, it did absolutely cripple the Maryland Health Department. And in fact, some of the board's investigative evidence and recordings, they were lost, which also likely affected the Puckett's complaint against Overton, where the family reportedly filed a public records request for the recordings from their interviews in 2019, only for them to be later told in a letter, all this time after, that they were likely lost in the ransomware attack. But there's also more to this story than a staffing shortage and a data breach. Another recent post-investigation found that the state regulations governing midwives, they're patchy at best, and a lack of national standards make it hard to hold midwives accountable when births go wrong. The post-investigation there is centering around Karen Carr, where she's a practicing, certified professional midwife who was given her license by the board in 2020, despite a felony conviction for child endangerment that resulted in a baby's death back in Virginia. And since that investigation, seven more families have spoken to the Post about midwives in Maryland and their home birthing experiences, saying that the Board of Nursing is putting the public at risk by not properly vetting midwives and investigating complaints. And these stories range from 2015 to last October. In fact, there are 36 direct entry midwives in Maryland. And according to an analysis by The Post, they have the highest rate of open complaints among all the professions that the board regulates. Their rate of complaints is 12 times higher than that of nurses. Just to give an example. And with this, we have seen some action being taken. Like last April, Maryland Governor Wes Moore signed an emergency bill directing the Secretary of Health to take over the administrative functions of the nursing board for two years. With the idea there being that this will allow board staff to focus on the big stuff, right? Licensing and investigations. But it's not clear that this will actually improve the speed or the investigation. However, the legislation also mandated a consultant report which said, quote, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing indicated that eliminating this backlog of investigations should be the number one priority for Maryland. But with that, words are words, promises are promises, but until something actually gets done and we see the results, that's all they are. So while we wait to see what happens from here, I would love to hear from you, whether it's just your thoughts in general, or if you are or have experiences with midwives. What have they been? The good, the bad? Have any been connected to the things that we're talking about today? And then, you know, my team and I at work, in a fast-paced environment. And clear and concise communication is crucial when going back and forth through Slack and email. And anything that saves us time or from confusion, it's clutch. So thankfully, the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Grammarly, provides us the tools to make our lives easier. Because Grammarly is an AI-powered writing tool that helps professionals write faster and better, not just more. So you can get stuff done and move your work forward. Also, I gotta mention their ID8 feature. Right? That gets you started with initial ideas, outlines, or even tips. Or like, find yourself stuck on a description? You just type in what you're looking for, like, give me five possible descriptions for this t-shirt. And bam, I'm not saying, oh, Oh, it's soft, it's buttery smooth. Right? Ideas that you can choose from or expand on, they pop up. Or also gotta mention how Grammarly can detect an email's context. So this is suggesting relevant responses to you for your conversation. And I mean, that especially comes in handy when you have those days where you just wake up on the wrong side of the bed. I have more and more these days. It saves me from myself and it saves me hours on my inbox. And if you're worried about security, Grammarly is the gold standard for responsible AI. I mean, they've been around for 14 years and they never sell your data to third parties. So are you ready to make a bigger impact at work? Well, just sign up and download Grammarly, the AI tool that you can trust. Just go to Grammarly.com slash PDS01 and all the features I mentioned are free. And then we're seeing a political shift in our country right now. Because while polling shows that Gen Z is more liberal than previous generations, when you dive into more of the specifics, like the, the differences become even bigger. With the biggest growing gap being between Gen Z men and women. Because right? for people aged 18 to 29, the share of women identifying as liberal shot up while men fell slightly. I mean, it's to the point that now women are nearly twice as likely to be liberal. Or they're more likely to care about political issues, vote, take part in social media movements and protests. And it appears that there were three key things that happened over the last seven, eight years. There was the Me Too movement, the election of Donald Trump, and the repeal of Roe v. Wade. And, you know, with some of those, we've seen similar things in the past. You had Pew Research noting when you look to Richard Nixon, you know, the baby boomers who turned 18 under Nixon were much more Democratic than the boomers who turned 18 under Jimmy Carter. And going back to the overturning of Roe v. Wade, 61% of young women at that time said it was a critical concern to them, while only 32% of young men said that. When it comes to guys, we see a big difference between millennials and Gen Z. Whereas a statistical majority of millennial men today identify as feminists, less than half of Gen Z guys said the same. With some of that being credited to Donald Trump, Andrew Tate, Jordan Peterson types, arguing that this kind of ties into the counterculture trends. Though some argue they've just grown because that sentiment was already there. Especially as of today, close to half of young men believe they face at least some discrimination, which is up from less than a third as recently as 2019. And you have things like in a 2020 survey, half of men agreeing with the statement, these days society seems to punish men just for acting like men. So when you see and hear those things and those numbers, it's not surprising to see since 2019, the share of white
white men aged 18 to 24 identifying as Republican has jumped 13 points. So notably, you know, if we pull back, we look at the full context, despite the recent shifts that we've seen, young men still tend to lean left and they're still more liberal than older men. You know, when we're talking about numbers, I think it is important that we talk about small and big, specific and grand because we really see countless examples of people misrepresenting the polling data. Like for example, there was a survey that went viral last year showed that 12th grade boys were twice as likely to identify as conservative than liberal. And while that was true there, it left out the very important thing that the overwhelming majority of respondents answered that they were moderate or none of the above or I don't know. In fact, according to other polling, young men make up more than 60% of political moderates. And as far as why, I mean, you have debates there. Some saying they just don't want to make those statements and be put in a box. Others saying, you know, they're still figuring their shit out. Though some data also appears to suggest that young men may be more politically indifferent than their female peers. With a recent survey last year finding that young women expressed greater concern for 11 out of 15 issues, that including drug addiction, crime, climate change, gun violence. And there actually wasn't a single issue that young men cared about significantly more than young women. And so while all of that is stand out for its own reasons, it also appears to be drastically changing who's in relationships with who. Because in surveys, we're seeing a lot of people responding to the question, would you date someone with different political views than you? Responding with a resounding no, which I think also makes sense. Like if you're a woman and you're for abortion rights, you're horrified by Roe v. Wade being overturned, how do you make peace sleeping with a guy that doesn't think that you should have a right over your body? Like that's not having a difference of opinion about border policy. Or like those are core to who you are, human shaping beliefs. And while I'm coming at this from a, a pro-choice viewpoint, like I just don't know how it makes sense in either person's head. If you're pro-choice, you're like, this guy doesn't think I should have a right to my body. But then in the situation, right, this guy, if he's pro-birth, if he actually believes what he believes, doesn't he think that this woman wants to be a baby murderer? Though, of course, understand I'm speaking in kind of generalities here, right? We live in the real world where all liberals and all conservatives don't believe one specific thing. I think there are just some of these things that go beyond just having a difference of opinion. But hey, with all this, I really would love to hear from you. Whether it be your thoughts about the drastic shift we're seeing in young men and young women, or specifically, what are your thoughts on dating or marrying someone with different politics? And again, I understand it. it's not a fully black and white situation where you stand politically. It can be more of on a spectrum. Yeah, I'm really fascinated to know what you think. And then finally, let's talk about yesterday today. Let's take a look at yesterday's show dive into those comments and see what y'all had to say. And there were definitely some trends in those comments. A lot of people not trusting Elon Musk. Libby Lou saying, I'm not even remotely surprised Elon would try to sneakily boost Mr. Beast's views and revenue and adding good on Jimmy for blatantly stating such. Which I will say, I did find it strange that a lot of people were like looping Jimmy into the conspiracy because I personally do not doubt that Elon and X they were super fucking like throwing gas on the fire for this post but I don't think that Mr. Beast made some like secret deal or he was a part of that especially because like his tweet where he shared the revenue even was like I wouldn't expect other people to make this I just think that Elon realized this could be a make or break moment for him also uh, one of y'all said uh, Mr. Beast X video scandal is not at all what it sounds like to which I just want to remind you I didn't change the name of Twitter. Elon Musk changed the name of Twitter to X. He wants people to post video to X. The natural way to talk about that thing is to note that it is X video. I didn't say X videos, which is a completely different website. And personally, it is offensive to me that you think that I titled the last video that in hopes to get clicks. What a preposterous idea. Then regarding Trump and DeSantis, I just, I, I have to share this comment. I think you wrote this comment in a way because you knew Phil, like I, I, this was a bait. Barton Farnsworth wrote, you know who really called the Trump victory over DeSantis? Philip DeFranco. It was almost a year ago that I remember Phil saying something to the effect of, yeah, Republicans don't care about January 6th. DeSantis can't beat Trump. And I genuinely believed he was wrong. And then John Oliver released a video about DeSantis and I thought, how could Phil possibly think Trump will get out of this? And here I am months later, wrong, just flat out wrong. And to you, I just want to say, it's not your fault. You got infected by the virus that is hope, but I've been vaccinated against hope all of my life, at least as it pertains in expecting the best from people, the lies people will believe and tell themselves to justify their position. In the long term, there is no limit to what bad actors can make people believe. You can give people short-term clarity, but time allows that fog to roll in. That's why you had all those people on January 6th going, this is not what America is. This is horrible. He needs, he needs to tell them to stop. He caused this. And then years later, they support and endorse him. You know, covering this bullshit is my job. And there's only so many times I can hear people go, this is the, this is the one that gets him. And I also, I know that there are always like overreactions to this, but I've read up uh, on too much of uh, the, the rise of the third right to believe that a stumble, whether general or with an attempted coup successfully leads to someone's downfall or them leaving if they're not fully held accountable. And then finally, we had people shocked and pissed about that first story involving the person who stole all those newspapers. Rory saying that's absolutely insane to me and adding, I wouldn't be shocked if the restaurant owner did something that the cops overlooked for one reason or another, so they blackmailed him into stealing or claiming to steal the papers. America is a raging dumpster fire and everything needs reform. As well as Babat saying, it makes them so angry. And saying as an assault victim who didn't feel like she could report because of going there on my own and having a freeze response, this pisses 
pisses me off so much. A girl deserves justice, and for people to know how much these boys are pieces of shit, I do wonder why this person who is supposedly not connected it was taking them. I'm willing to bet there was some connection that just hasn't come out yet. And while I will say, I like, I can't co-sign the, the blackmail uh, idea, it does feel like there is a missing piece to this puzzle. But hey, uh, for now, this is where we are, and uh, where we are is the end of today's show. As always, thank you for being a part of these daily dives into the news, hitting that like button, support in all the ways you do. Also, friendly reminder, join the text line, 813-213-4423. We have that drop coming tomorrow. Be the first to get in before it sells out. But hey, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow.